Translators of the English Revised Version will be our topic this morning. The translators. Now you may have visions in your mind of months and months of study we did on the KJV looking at the men. Well, we're not going to do that with the ERV because it's not as important a translation as the KJV. So we're not going to spend nearly the amount of time. What I hope to do is to be able to discuss both the Old Testament scholars and the New Testament scholars here this morning. I was going to divide it up, but maybe I can uh, talk quickly and put some material together, and we can do it all in on um, one morning in one service then. You might guess, as we learn with the KJV, that the men are as important as the book itself, as the work itself, because the book is them. It's their thoughts, their views, their interpretations, their prejudices, for the better, for the worse, that come out in any translation. And so we're going to start looking at these. But they are um, some of the most illustrious biblical scholars of that day in England. Now, at first, the lower house of convocation wanted only Anglicans to be a part of the committee. But as we saw last time, last Sunday morning, from the last resolution of five, that the lower house in its desire was conquered by majority vote so that the proposal was any man from any country or any religious body in the world could be a part of the translating committee. That's a rather open-ended invitation, I think. Any person, that's fine, from any religious body of the world, that'd mean Christian and non-Christian would be invited to participate. And so here's what we end up with. Uh, there, end, there ended up being 65 scholars, with more, of course, on the Old Testament committee by maybe a half or so than on the New Testament committee. 65 scholars. Now, I start by breaking them down according to religious affiliation. And you'll see how the case is stacked. And I am going to give you a list of all of these men's names, but and I, I hope you won't get writer's cramp writing them down because we need to go quickly and we'll just spend a little time on the ones that are more important. But first of all, we'll start with religious affiliation. 65 scholars. 41 came from what church would you guess? Anglican. Anglican, yes. I thought you said any religious body in the world. That's pretty stacked as far as I can tell. 41. I didn't figure the percentage. The mathematician can do it for us real quickly in their mind, maybe. That's a huge percentage. 41 out of 65 came from the Church of England. Then under that, we would have five from the Church of Scotland. So you haven't gone very far away from home. Under that, five from the Scottish Free Church. So there's... 50 out of 65, pretty much from home. Four from the Baptist Church. Three Congregationalists. Two Episcopal Church of Ireland. Two Methodists. One Episcopal Church of Scotland. One United Presbyterian. So far we've got a total of 64. That leaves us one more man, one more church. You end up with 10 religious bodies represented here. And finally, one Unitarian. Now, two cases to me, that would be 41 Church of England, five Scotland, five Scottish Free Church, four Baptists, three Congregationalists, two Episcopal Church Ireland, two Methodists, one Episcopal Church Scotland, one United Presbyterian, one Unitarian. Two cases, to me anyway, in my opinion, are of particular note, one addition and one omission here. Let's deal with the omission first of all and we'll come back to the obvious addition. Look down in the list that you have before you. What one religious body is conspicuously absent? 
Roman Catholics. Yes, that's the obvious omission here. So let's talk about that for just a moment. They did not invite Roman Catholic scholars, with the exception of the leading Catholic theologian of the entire 19th century. You know who that was? Some of you Catholics ought to know. Of the 19th century, the 1800s. Who's the leading Catholic theologian in the world? He happened to be English speaking. Oh, no, I, no, way back. That's back in 1200s. Well, I didn't think you had probably heard of him, but um, he is a very famous writer. And, well, let me tell you who he is. I'm going to talk about him. John Henry Newman. John Henry Newman, the leading Catholic theologian in the world, in the English speaking world, and probably in the world. Unless, of course, you want to throw the popes in and so forth. But I'd vote for John Henry Newman. They invited John Henry Newman to participate. Uh, I need to tell you a little of Newman's background. He was born in 1801 and dies in 1890. So his lifespan pretty much spans that entire century. John Henry Newman was an Anglican. He was a member of the Oxford Movement, what was known as the Oxford Movement, which was... Um, a movement among the higher-ups in the Anglican Church for a Catholic Reformation of Anglicanism. Reformation in reverse, in other words. They felt that, that Anglicanism was the faith, not Roman Catholicism, that Anglicanism was the faith, but they needed to have their church or their faith restored more in light of the first five centuries of church history, which, of course, they felt to be Roman Catholic years. Um, so John Henry Newman, I mean, as part of that group, it already shows your religious inclination toward Roman Catholicism. And so he was a member of the Oxford group, the leader of the group, which was just a famous movement going on in Oxford, England at this time, for uh, a long period of time until, of course, he does the obvious. He finally converts to Roman Catholicism. And so of all things, notice we've got the Anglican faith stacked here with 41 committee members from that church. And so it was quite a deed for them to extend a hand of welcome to one who had been of their own party, an Anglican, John Henry Newman, and who had converted to Roman Catholicism. Now, I put John Henry Newman in the same category with G.K. Chesterfield, if you've ever heard of G.K. Chesterfield. Uh, Chesterfield lived a little bit later, up into this century, as a matter of fact, and, of course, obviously born a little later than Newman. But these happen to be kind of two of my favorite writers from that period, and from Roman Catholic circles. If you can have a favorite writer that's a Roman Catholic, I have enjoyed them, especially G.K. Chesterfield. I did look up, just quickly, in a book that all of you have, or at least a lot of you, have now come to recognize is probably the most important book you can have on your shelf besides your Bible, and that's Elwell's Evangelical Dictionary of Theology. I, w I didn't know whether they'd have Newman's name in there or not, but I thought they would, and I assumed they wouldn't have Chesterfield. They have both. There's long articles on both of the men. I didn't read them. All I looked up was to see whether the names were there. But um, you could look up yourself and read more about Newman and read more about Chesterfield because it is in uh, Elwell's Evan Evangelical Dictionary of Theology. Not all of you have that, I realize, but I've talked about it before, and some of you do have it now. Besides the Bible, and of course these statements can always, I guess, be modified in the future or whatever, that'd be probably the most important book to have. It just is so packed. It's such a reference book. And maybe along with it, the NIV Study Bible, because you have a huge commentary there. Uh, Newman is more the theological writer. I mean, he, he became a cardinal. He went to Rome, to the Vatican. Um, he was conducted, inducted into the priesthood there, and he actually ends up as a cardinal. So you often hear of him as Cardinal Newman. You know which Newman they're talking about, John Henry Newman. Um, but he was quite a profound theological writer. And I guess they're a big interest to me because of the recent inclination of some people, not from something as close to Catholicism as Anglicanism, but as far away as United States evangelicalism, like Thomas Howard, have also made the huge step of crossing over the Tiber River. And uh, Thomas Howard has done that recently. Uh, G.K. Chesterfield, of course, he doesn't figure in with what our, we're talking about this morning in the ERV, but he's the more popular of the writer. He was one of the profound influences, by the way, on C.S. Lewis. If you read G.K. Chesterfield after you've read Lewis, you see a lot of Chesterfield in Lewis, and you can tell. You know, Lewis's 
Lewis has this way of, of writing the neatest sentences. He doesn't just go on and on and on in such deep theology that only the scholars can follow. Anyone can follow C.S. Lewis. He's so catchy and so humorous. That's exactly the way G.K. Chesterfield is. He's known for all these famous quotations. One I gave you I know not long ago was Chesterfield's quote, Christianity is a truth-telling thing. Well, anyone could have thought of that, but they didn't. Chesterfield thought of that. Christianity, he said, I'll tell you what that is. That's a truth-telling thing. I mean, you'd think if someone asked you, what is it? Well, it is a faith that, and you'd go into a description of the truth. And Chesterfield cut it short. That's what good writers, popular writers can do. Someone asked him, what is it? And he said, I'll tell you what it is. It's a truth-telling thing. And he said that as a Roman Catholic. I think Chesterfield converted like in the early 1920s. But two very popular, very famous Roman Catholics, both of whom were Anglicans first, Chesterfield was also, who convert to Roman Catholicism. So there's just one interesting side point here about Chesterfield and some more about Newman. But Newman does fit here specifically. He was the only Roman Catholic scholar invited to participate, and he declined. He preferred not to be on the committee. Of course, this is way up toward the end of his life now, so he's a very old man. He's 70 years old at this time. I said there were two cases of note, one omission, one Inclusion, Of course, the inclusion would be that last church group you have there, the Unitarians. The leading Unitarian scholar in England, Dr. G. Vance Smith, G. Vance, V-A-N-C-E, Vance Smith, was also invited. The, these would be the two anomalies on the committee, a John Henry Newman and a Vance Smith. Vance Smith is not well known today. He was also invited, and as you can see from our inclusion of his church body, he did accept, and his acceptance caused quite a stir in England. Because the Unitarian faith, if you haven't already learned, is an anti-non-Christian faith. And to have a Unitarian translating the Bible is um, stupid. It's the most diplomatic word I can think of right now caused quite a stir in England. This was especially true on June the 22nd, 1870, when Dr. Smith was allowed to partake of the inaugural communion with his fellow revisers in, of all places, Westminster Abbey. To have a Unitarian scholar in partaking of communion at the beginning of the translating work was just um, unheard of. For the Church of England, when I say that, I don't mean Anglicanism, I just mean the church in England was in, up in arms over this. On June the 22nd, 1870, all of the scholars were together and partook of the inaugural communion. And one of those people at the communion service was the Unitarian apostate, Dr. Vance Smith. And of all places, irony of ironies, it was in Westminster Abbey. I mean, the Westminster, quote, divines, unquote, would not, they would have turned over in their grave had they seen something like this. Okay, let's jump into, if you're up to date there, Old Testament Committee. Old Testament Committee. Now, the most thorough list that I have seen gives us 37 men. 37 men. And we are going to list those for you here in just a moment. Of these, 11 which is a large number, that's a quarter of them, died during the work. Some of them earlier, some of them later. Most of them in the 1870s, eight of them, three of them in the 1880s when the work was almost done. Eleven of them died during the work. Almost all of them are from the higher critical school. Almost all of them. You search Jerusalem with a lamp in vain to find a conservative among these Old Testament committee members. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you their names now in order, and just right quickly, you'll have them down, and we're not going to talk about any of them except um, the important ones, which may be one, two, three, four, five, maybe five or six from what I can see. I'll say a sentence or two about them. They're not that important. Some of them are. Some of them are more than others. And I'll give them to you in alphabetical order. 
And I'll also give the year of their death if they are one of those 11 who die before the work finally comes off the press. And I have their degrees and where they taught or where they pastored and everything. I don't suppose I'll give that to you. That may just take up too much time. Okay, here we go. So you just want a number from 1 to 37 and we'll be giving you these men. And I'll, I'll tell you what else. I'll give you just the, the first initial and then I'll give you the last name. W. Alexander died 1884. One of the ones at the very, very end of the work. R. Bensley, B-E-N-S-L-Y. J. Burrell, B-I-R-R-E-L-L. -L. E. Brown, with an E on the end of Brown. F. Chance. O. Chenery. C. H. E. N. E. R. Y. T. K. Shane. We'll pause here for a moment. T. K. Shane. C. H. E. Y. N. E. One of the better known on the committee, he was born in 1841, died in 1915. You probably don't recognize his name, but he was greatly influenced by a man you will recognize, and that was Ewald, E-W-A-L-D. Back to Old Testament introduction, the theories of who wrote the Pentateuch. Greatly influenced by the liberal critical scholar Ewald. Of course, Shane himself was a critical scholar who accepted, as did most of these men, the documentary hypothesis of the Pentateuch, the JEDP theory. He did not become a member of the, R, the ERV committee until rather late, which was good, I guess. And the final note on Shane, he was co-editor of that period's publication of Encyclopedia Britannica. He was a co-editor. That's come out, you know, Britannica, I don't know how many editions, but over the last couple of hundred years, for whatever edition was being published around this time, Shane was co-editor. So just take a note there, and that's why I'm pausing on a few of these, because I think giving you a, f a little information on a few of these will give you the flavor of the committee that he was a critical scholar who did accept the documentary hypothesis. In other words, Moses did not write the Pentateuch. Okay, the next man will also pause here, A.B. Davidson. A.B. Davidson. 1831-1902. He comes from a Scottish background. A very well-known critical scholar and in his day, a superb Old Testament lecture. He wrote commentaries on Job, Ezekiel, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zechariah for the Cambridge Bible commentary set. You'll often see that in works. Anything that's non-conservative, you'll see them referring to the Cambridge Bible commentary set. And it's a very critical work. Uh, he published his famous work entitled Theology of the Old Testament. I forgot to bring that along. I grabbed, you can see I grabbed a stack of books, but I forgot to get all of them. Theology of the Old Testament in 1904 which is just what it says in Old Testament theology, which is very liberal and critical. He wrote many articles for Encyclopedia Britannica. He wrote many articles for Hastings' Dictionary of the Bible. Again, I'm just giving you more things to increase your education. Hastings' Dictionary of the Bible. And he's probably best remembered 
for his work entitled Introductory Hebrew Grammar, published in 1874. He's probably best remembered for that because Davidson's grammar is still around, and so is his theology. I don't have his grammar, but I do have his Old Testament theology. Introductory Hebrew Grammar, 1874. Another critical scholar. Okay, continuing on our list, whatever your next number is, B. Davies. D-A-V-I-E-S. G. Douglas. S. R. Driver. Samuel Rolls Driver. Let's pause here. Born 1846, died 1914. He was of Quaker descent, and he was the successor to the well-known conservative E.B. Pusey. Pusey's writings are still around. P-U-S-E-Y, E.B. Pusey. He was the successor to E.B. Pusey in the Hebrew chair at Oxford. By the way, Pusey is probably best known for his commentary on Daniel, which is still in print, either Baker or Clock and Clock for, in Minneapolis. has recently published um, Pusey's, it's a hardback commentary on the book of Daniel, a big thick hardback. Pusey was a conservative, and so of all things, of course, we're seeing the changing of the guard during the, 18th, during the 19th century from conservatism to liberalism. So Pusey held the Hebrew chair at Oxford, he was a conservative, and his successor was certainly not S.R. Driver. Back to Driver. Driver wrote commentaries on about half of the Old Testament's books. These were no mean men, to use the KJV M-E-A-N. These were no mean men. These were among the greatest scholars England had to offer. But greatness has to then be interpreted in light of Scripture. Uh, among his best-known commentaries would be the following. I say he wrote on about half the Old Testament books. That'd be about 20 books. Best known would be Deuteronomy, and probably in this order, Deuteronomy, Joel, Amos, Daniel, and Genesis. Deuteronomy, Joel, Amos, Daniel, and Genesis. Wrote commentaries on those. Like Davidson, he contributed to Hastings' Dictionary of the Bible. Many, many dictionaries, and Hastings is one of the old standards, but it has just too much liberalism in it. It's still around today. It's too much liberalism. His introduction to the literature of the Old Testament is a work we've given you many years ago back in the old building with O.T. Intro. Introduction to the Literature of the Old Testament, 1897. Which was a critical work that was kind of the standard in the field for the next half century. And he is probably best known, however, for this. What's that, BDB? Brown Driver Briggs Lexicon. And this right here is our man, Samuel Rolls Driver. Brown Driver Briggs. Lexicon, it's a Hebrew lexicon. And that's probably where he's best known. Of all things, there he is hidden right in the middle of that with that little initial D. That is driver, this driver. Brown Driver Briggs Lexicon, often just referred to as BDB. Oh, yes. See, almost every one of these guys. I haven't passed a conservative yet. Okay, let's go on with our names then. After Driver, still in alphabetical order, we have C. Elliot. C. Elliot. Am I going too fast for you? After that, we have A. Fairbairn. Do you know the important Fairbairn? Probably don't. The important one's Patrick of this century. <coughs> but that's a different Fairbairn than this one. A. M. Fairbairn. F. Field. 
F. Field, J. D. Geddon, G. E. D. E. N. Then we have C. Ginsburg, C. Ginsburg, F. Gotch, like Notch. G O T C H F Gotch B Harrison and you could probably figure out a lot of these places you know there'd be teachers at Cambridge or Oxford or you know one of these places that's where a lot of these will be then we have A Hervey H E R V E Y J. Jeb, J E B B, J. Jeb, W. K, K A Y, S. Leeds, L E A T H E S, J. Lumby, L U M B Y J McGill A Olivet. We mentioned him last week. He's the one who helped uh, uh, Wilberforce get the right facts into the petition. You know, let's have the uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament since. The Wilberforce through in Hebrew, speaking of the New Testament. A. Olivet, O L L I V A N T. Then we have J. Peron, P E R O W N E. And then we have E. H. Plumter, someone we mentioned last time. E. H. Plumter, born 1821, died 1891. Oh, I've been forgetting to give you who were the ones that died. Oh well, doesn't matter. They're all dead today. Hard, <laughs> <laughs> hard on that. He was a liberal, classical scholar and poet. Remember, he was one of the ones, you know, not in favor of change, and he ends up being on the committee. I gave you a couple of names of people who said that we, they didn't want change, or if they did, then now wasn't the time to end up on the committee to bring the change in the KJV. Sorry about that, that I didn't give you all the names of the dead ones. It doesn't make any difference, so. The next man, H. Rose, R-O-S-E, H. Rose. The next man, A. Sace, or Sacy. S-A-Y-C-E. The next one, W. Selwyn. And there's a more famous Selwyn than this one. And of course, you probably don't know this, but if you happen to ever come across it in the future, then maybe you'll remember I've said something. The other Selwyn wrote a commentary on 1 Peter. That's kind of like a standard commentary on 1 Peter. But he lived in this century, 20th century. So those are different Selwyns, S-E-L-W-Y-N. This is W. Selwyn. The next one, R.P. Smith. And what number are we on now? W. Robertson Smith. W. Robertson Smith. Born 1846 died 1894 he was the most famous pupil of Davidson <coughs> A.B. Davidson that you have earlier on your list as maybe number six or seven and you, you might not remember this from many years ago in OT intro but well this part you will remember that most of the critical theories arose in Germany you do remember that yeah. they arose in Germany the man most responsible for importing all these higher critical theories and views into England was this man right here, 
W. Robertson Smith. And I told you that. You can look way on those earlier tapes or notes from the um, uh, documentary hypothesis and theories of the Pentateuch, all the critical school that we looked at earlier that I said Robertson Smith was the man most responsible for the widespread influence of German higher critical theories in England. He was a professor of Oriental languages and Old Testament exegesis, professor of Oriental languages and Old Testament exegesis. You might never have learned how to spell that word. at the Free Church College in Aberdeen. Now, he only remained professor here for a period of time, the Free Church College in Aberdeen. He remained here for a while until he was suspended temporarily from the faculty because of the articles, which were higher critical liberal articles, which he contributed on the subject of religion in the Old Testament to the Encyclopedia Britannica. A lot of these guys, you see, are writing articles for Encyclopedia Britannica at this time. And Free Church College in Aberdeen was a conservative school at the time. And so when they saw the publication of Smith's liberal critical theories in Encyclopedia Britannica, he was suspended. The charges were dropped and his job now put bread on his table became editor-in-chief that's the top position of Britannica and W. Robertson Smith held that goes to show you something else we've been talking about that in earlier years church men were often the men highest up in all areas and that's been in you know, modern times of all things of Britannica it was controlled by church men Okay, let's round out these Old Testament names and get into the New Testament ones. After Smith, we have C. Thirlwall. <coughs> T-H-I-R-L, Thirlwall. W-A-L-L. C. Thirlwall. D. Weir. W-E-I-R. C. Wordsworth. W. Wright, last name spelled with a W, W. Wright, and now we're on 37 then, right? W. A. Wright. Who was secretary of the Old Testament committee? In other words, chairman of the committee. He was librarian at Trinity College in Cambridge. So this man, W. A. Wright, was the chairman of the Old Testament ERV committee. W.A. Wright, chairman, librarian of Trinity College, Cambridge. Okay, we come to the New Testament and its committee. The most thorough list I have seen totals 25 members. Now, when you add that to the 37 of the Old Testament, that equals 62 men in all. But I said earlier that there were 65 total. So I have to confess the other names I have not been able to locate. We'd be missing three names then. I have simply not been able to locate who those three men were. Maybe they were bench warmers and their names just never got on the important list or they brought tea into the men whenever they got tired and thirsty. So all I can do is give you my best, 37 for the old and 25 for the new. Now, the New Testament committee is more important because it has more famous men on it, many more famous men than the old. And so, again, we'll list them in alphabetical order and comment on nine or so of the more famous ones. Number one of 25, Henry Alford. Do you remember him? We just discussed him a few messages ago with his translation in four volumes, 1869. Uh, but he died the year that the committee work began, 1870-71, around there, 1871. So Alford didn't really have anything to do with it. But he was on the committee, and he had given us his translation, which we've looked at earlier. 
Number two, J. Angus, A N G U S, E. Bickersteth, Bickersteth, just like it sounds. J. Blakesley, J. Blakesley. And the next one, David Brown. David Brown, born 1803, died 1897. I mention him as one author of three of the famous three-volume Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary set, often called JFB. Here's the last of three volumes of that set, David Brown. <clears throat> Brown happened to be responsible for Matthew through Romans in the commentary set, which would be found in this third volume that I have, which is New Testament, Matthew through Revelation. Now, Jameson Fawcett Brown is one of the most famous English commentary sets. Of course, it's old, done back, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, but it's still read today, it's still appreciated today. It's not on the same level as some of the newer work that's been done, like Expositor's Bible Commentary set or the New International Commentary set on the Old Testament and New Testament. But it is recommended. Well, I have read it. Um, it's a powerful set. It's based on the King James translation. And my advice, some of you have this, my advice would be the following from my own observation. The Pentateuch and the Gospels are by far superior, in my estimation, than any of the other work done here. Remember, we've got three different men, Jameson, last names, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. Different men assigned different books, so we're going to have different, you know, levels of greatness involved in it. And I would say that the Pentateuch, especially the book of Leviticus, you know how difficult Leviticus is to get anything out of it? Uh, it's a very powerful work when it comes to Leviticus. And the same is true with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. With, of course, Brown being responsible for that latter good section, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it's an old set, still available. Uh, maybe I'll send it around. You can see it's a big set. It's hard to get all the way through. Brown is also known for a book that's being republished today entitled Christ's Second Coming. You think I'm going to use this to get into eschatology again? Amen. Well, I'm tempted to, but I better not. That's come out in every teaching, it seems like. Ethics, biblical lit, ITP, probably yeah. we've even mentioned it in screw tape. Christ's second coming, <laughs> will it be premillennial? And, of course, his answer is no. <laughs> this is, again, one of the famous post-mill treatises on the millennium. And it's published by Baker today, and that's probably why they're bringing it back out. Schaff Herzog Religious Encyclopedia calls it a classic. I haven't read the book, but um, from what I know about it, it is a classic on post-millennialism. Baker Editions, published in, uh, 18, in 1983. Looks like it first came out in 1876, but now you can get it a little cheap $5 paperback edition. Christ's Second Coming, Will It Be Premillennial by David Brown. Very famous post-mill book. Okay, next man on our list is John Eddy. E-A-D-I-E. -E. 1810 to 1872. See, by the way, you see, Brown offered all these guys are conservatives. All of a sudden, you come to the New Testament committee, we've got it kind of stacked in favor of a lot of conservatives here. Um, they're not dispensational pre mill or whatever, but they are Calvinists and they are conservatives. You get on the Old Testament side, and for some reason, it's just not true. But Alfred's a conservative, and David Brown's a conservative, and John Eddy is a conservative. Eddie wrote a widely read set of commentaries covering some of Paul's epistles, those from Galatians through Thessalonians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, from Galatians through Thessalonians. He has written a five-volume set that also has been recently republished by Baker. 
And I think it was the um, uh, stature gained by the publication of this set, which came out in 1869, that was responsible for him being appointed to the New Testament Committee. Because I don't think that Eddie was well known prior to that, but then he writes this five volume set on uh, the Greek New Testament and he becomes famous. And so this is what, volume one, John Eddie Greek text commentaries on Galatians. You got four other volumes that cover from Ephesians through Second Thessalonians. See, these guys are a lot better known than most of the ones we've looked at earlier. Okay, after Eddie, if you can write while you're looking and passing the books around, C. Ellicott. Now we had an Eliot in the Old Testament committee, but C. Ellicott. E. L. L. I. C. O. T. T. And then how about the next man? See if you know this. Fenton John Anthony Hort. F. J. A. Hort. Well, we'd expect Westcott and Hort to be on the committee. I mean, they're two of the most important guys responsible for all of the um, textual critical theories at this time. So far, we haven't seen Westcott yet, but we have come across Hort now. F. J. A. Hort, born 1828, died 1892. Of course, Westcott and Hort's theories have been quite a bit modified today. Um, but they started the, the pathfinding, pathblazing work, of course. Now, his name is already famous and I think very familiar to all of you. I just jotted down, looking on the tape list, that'd be Lit Tape 44, entitled Westcott Hort Theory. <coughs> Lit Tape 44 is where we discuss who these two men are, where they talk, their background, and so forth. Lit Tape 44, Westcott Hort Theory. Of course, you know he's important for the textual critical theories. Um, we'll say more about him and Westcott later. They do publish a Greek New Testament at the same time that all of this other work is being done on the English ERV. And Horn is known for other books. I pulled um, one out of my library. It's an important work entitled Judaistic Christianity. Again, it's a Baker publication, the twin book series. Um, well, let me see, how can I describe this? Well, he's got chapters like Christ and the Law, the early church at Jerusalem, the church of Antioch, the independent activity of Paul, the epistles of Roman captivity, the pastoral epistles, first epistle of Peter, Apocalypse, church at Jerusalem, from Titus to Hadrian, the Judaizers of the Ignatian epistles, the epistle of Barnabas, the Palestinian Ebionites, Ebion was an old Hebrew term, so forth. He's dealing with Christianity as it was birthed in a Jewish context and dealing with those Christians who, who were Jews and who became Christians and how their Judaism continued to affect their Christianity. So you see Fenton John Anthony Hort. Okay, the next writer, W. Humphrey. W. Humphrey. B. Kennedy. And this was an early ancestor of JFK. No, I don't know that. I just said that. <laughs> Someone's already writing it down. No, Kennedy, he doesn't have any theological blood in him at all. <laughs> Catholic blood, but not theological blood. W. Lee, L-E-E. -E. W. Lee. The next man, J.B. Lightfoot. 1828. 1889. You, I am sure, have heard of him. But there are at least three important Lightfoots in history, and Gordon was not one of them. John, <laughs> that didn't register on all of you. You'll have to ask the ones who are laughing what that meant. I don't even know what it meant. I just said it. John was an English scholar in the 1600s. I don't know if you've never heard of Gordon Lightfoot, evidently. John was an English scholar. That's obviously not this one, J.B. Lightfoot. I'm saying there are three important Lightfoot. Forget the Gordon thing. That might have thrown you for a loop. There are three important Lightfoots in history. We're going to find out which one this one is, the J.B. one. First of all, there was a John Lightfoot, an English scholar of the 1600s. Then there was a Robert Henry Lightfoot of the 1900s, another English scholar. 
Robert Henry Lightfoot in the 1900s. But the most famous of the Lightfoots was J.B. Joseph Barber Lightfoot, who lived during the 1800s. So you got to get the right centuries, the 1600s, the 1800s, the 1900s, for John Joseph Barber and Robert Henry, respectively. J.B. Lightfoot was a student of B.F. Westcott at Cambridge. And by all estimation, by friends as well as foes, Lightfoot was one of the most brilliant people in the world of his day. J.B. Lightfoot. Fluent in seven languages. Now other men, of course, have spoken more. We've given you that with the cane JV. But he was fluent. That's better than I can do, so I'm no critic of Lightfoot. Fluent in seven languages. He is most famous for people today for his edition of the Apostolic Fathers that a lot of you have in this paperback edition, Baker again. Sounds like Baker. I must be their rep this morning or something. <laughs> Apostolic Fathers by Light, but that's his own translation. You can get this in other forms. I've got Apostolic Fathers in other forms besides J.B. Lightfoot's translation. This is J.B. Lightfoot's translation. He's also known for his great commentaries on, on four of Paul's epistles, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Great commentaries. The best known and the best of these is on the book of Galatians. Still read today. Of course, much advancement has come over the years, but a lot of what Lightfoot had to say just can't be surpassed. On Galatians, Philippians, Colossians and Philemon. Uh, here's a modern reprint of Whitefoot's. I just brought the Galatians, although I've got the set of them in my study. In 1981 by Hendrickson Publishers down in Boston. I didn't pass all of these around, but here's commentary on Galatians. They're hardback and they're in um, you know, brown back like that. To say that again, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And Galatians is the best known. You read, in other words, you read modern commentaries today on Galatians, and uh, you turn back to the book, to turn to the back of the book, and in the bibliography, you'll often find J.B. Lightfoot's commentary of a century ago. Okay, after Lightfoot, C. Merivale. M-E-R-I-V-A-L-E. W. Milligan, Milligan, M-I-L-L-I-G-A-N. G. Moberly, Moberly. The next one, W. F. Moulton, W. F. Moulton. eighteen thirty five to eighteen ninety eight. Now this becomes a little confusing. Notice that I gave you another M man earlier here, Milligan. Well there are two famous Milligans and two famous Moultons. The famous ones were not the ones who were on the ERV committee. But some of them are related down to third generation, at least with the Moulton family, down to our day and age with these Moultons. They're still around as biblical scholars today. So there are two famous Moultons and two famous Milligans. Um, let's start with the Moultons first of all. Uh, the Moultons, the famous Moultons, were a father and son. W.F. Moulton was the father. James was the son. Both of them are best known for their work on the Greek New Testament. The Greek New Testament. For instance, the father, which is the man we're talking about with the ERV New Testament Committee, <coughs> the father, W.F. Moulton, worked with this man, A.S. Geddon. And see, we gave you a Geddon, I think, for the Old Testament Committee. Didn't we give you a Geddon? 
Yes, but see, it's a different Geddon. It's a JD Geddon instead of an AS Geddon. So there's a lots of confusion, and people have... I've even seen in writings where people should have known better. They're talking about Moulton or Milligan, and they're saying, yes, the one who did this was the one who worked on the ERV, and they got it mistaken just because the, both of the names are famous. Two Moultons and two Milligans, they're easy to get swamped up. And I think the same is true with Geddon because he... Uh, a. Geddon was on the Old Testament committee, but the more important one worked with the less important of the Moultons, the father, W.F., who was on the New Testament ERV committee. So let me say all that again and simplify. The father, William, did a concordance with A.S. Geddon. And I'll show you another step of confusion, which is this. Concordance to the Greek Testament you see W.F. Moulton and A.S. Geddon. And there's another name underneath all of that. H.K. Moulton. Well, that couldn't be James Moulton. Has to be another Moulton there. So here's what's happened. The father, William, works with A.S. Geddon on this concordance to begin with. Then illness in the elder Moulton forces him to his bed, and his son, James, helps A.S. Geddon finish the concordance. And then the concordance as we have today, which my copy is a fifth edition, was then revised by the grandson of this man we're talking about here, W.F. Moulton. So that's where we get the three Moultons now. Well, you got three famous Moultons. You got the father who did the ERV and who started on this concordance, the son who finished this concordance with Geddon, and then his son, who, like in 1952 or so, has revised this and given us the fifth edition. I'll send this around, and you can open it up and see what a Greek concordance looks like. But it's a responsibility of this man that we're talking about, as well as his son, as well as his son. Now let's talk about James. By the way, James is the important one of the two. Moultons. James, the son of W.F., is the important one. James went on to work on what became known as, in four volumes, I believe, today, the grammar of New Testament Greek. The grammar of New Testament Greek. I did not bring this along. He did the first volume and much of the second volume. This is a four-volume work which was then finished by Howard and Turner. So you got three men who did grammar of the New Testament Greek. The son, James, not only has done the grammar of New Testament Greek, has helped his father finish this concordance set, is passing around now, but the son, James, is most famous because of his vocabulary of the Greek New Testament that he did which is this big work, Vocabulary of the Greek Testament, illustrated from the papyri and other non-literary sources. Notice it was done by a Milton, and notice it was done by a Milligan, a George Milligan. Well, this is not the Milligan that I've just given you for a New Testament ERV committee member. So in other words, now we see, here's where I think the problem generally can trace itself back to is this volume right here, since it's done by a Milton and Milligan. And people think right away, well, those were the two men who did the ERV. No, those were different Moultons and different Milligans there. So vocabulary of the Greek New Testament. Okay, let's go on to our next man then. That would be S. Newth, N-E-W-T-H, S. Newth. E. Palmer, A. Roberts, R. Scott, next man F. H. A. Scrivener, F. H. A, three initials, Scrivener, 1813 to 1891, Famous New Testament 
English scholar and textual critic who supported the TR. You go back to our studies in textual criticism and he was one of the opponents of Westcott and Hort. So it's a little surprising to find him on the committee of a translation team which is um, using all of the critical work the textual critical work, not the liberal critical work, but the textual critical work, which has been supplied by men like Westcott and Hort. In other words, Scrivener was a KJV Textus Receptus fan. Uh, he published many ancient texts, and Scrivener also was known for the fact that he devised a system to classify them. Remember how we've talked about the papyri and the minuscules and majuscules and uncials and Pretty soon they ran out of Greek letters and had to go. Well, Scrivener was one of the ones who figures in this whole thing. You can see that on some of the earlier tapes. Okay, then we have G. V. Smith. That's the Unitarian, Vance Smith. G. V. Smith. A. P. Stanley. Should leave us three men to look at. The next one, S.P. Tregellis. You know him also, 1813 to 1875. S.P. Tregellis. He was raised a Quaker. We've talked about him also recently in Bib Lit because he was in with the Plymouth Brethren and John Nelson Darby. They knew each other. And Tregellis knew about um, Margaret MacDonald and Edward Irving and her alleged prophecy of pre-tribulationism, the so-called secret rapture, and so forth. Tregellis was in on all this. He was raised a Quaker, and so because of that, he could not pursue a career through the universities. Quakers were, of course, opposed to higher education. So he was not trained in the schools. He trained himself. As a day laborer, he taught himself Greek, he already knew English, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Welsh. No formal schooling, but he couldn't. He was a Quaker. But he taught himself, just as a day laborer, I think he might have cobbled shoes or something. He learned, taught himself Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Welsh. He came up with some of the most important principles of textual criticism. You know, such as, you know, should the longer or the shorter one be suspected as being reliable, or should the more difficult or the easier one. You know, he came up with some of these very important principles at the same time, but independently from Lachman. He's the other famous name with textual critics. L-A-C-H-M-A-N-N. -A -N. Lachman came up with some of these same principles. That the shorter was to be preferred because scribes often would try to make something longer to fill it out. They never cut material out and the difficult over the easier because the scribes would try to smooth the rough places out. He came up with some of these theories, Lockman, at the same time, but independently from Tregellis. He helped with uh, Wigram's Englishman's Greek and Hebrew Concordance, which I think a lot of you have because it can be used by people who don't speak Greek and Hebrew. Tregellis helped with the Englishman's Greek and Hebrew Concordance a lot of you have that. Tregellis published a Greek New Testament from 1857 to 1872. Uh, he translated uh, Jesenius's Hebrew lexicon. This was the um, earlier one prior to BDB that was in use by everyone until BDB was done, Jesenius, entitled Hebrew Lexicon. He translated Jesenius Hebrew Lexicon from, of course, Hebrew into English. He wrote many books on Bible prophecy. He was pre-mill, but it seems as though but at the end of his life, he comes out post-trib, even though he has a lot of influence from the pre-trib people. He's pre-mill, post-trib. And that is because 
although raised as a Quaker, and he starts out with the Plymouth Brethren, in his later life, he switches allegiance to the Presbyterian Church and right before his death to the Anglican Church. And let's stick these other men in here quickly then. R.C. Trench, 1807-1886, famous because of some of these works, Notes on the Parables, I didn't bring that along. Notes on the Miracles of Our Lord. I didn't bring that along. And I did bring along synonyms of the New Testament. Maybe I forgot the other two because after looking at Scribe and Tregellis, you're thinking about Greek and Hebrew. So uh, Richard C. Trench, synonyms of the New Testament, studies in the Greek New Testament in paperback form. Praise God, it's not Baker, it's Erdman's. <laughs> he was a leading influence in the formative years of the Oxford English Dictionary, which is kind of like the standard dictionary for the English language today. R.C. Trench was a leading influence in the formative years of the Oxford English Dictionary. And the last name on our list this morning is J. Troutbeck. Trout, like in trout fish, Beck, B-E-C-K. J. Troutbeck not famous. <laughs> so that covers all the men and we'll start looking at the work next Sunday morning. Do I need to say anything else? Did you get trenched down? Notes on the parables, notes on the miracles of our Lord. He's not here yet. Let's keep looking for him though. He will show his face a little later on. Good question. Where's B.F. Westcott? So keep remembering that. He will show his face later on. And you can pass the books around, look what you want to, and send them back up here when you get through. Yes, what did I give you? 26. Well, that means I found one of those three men. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now I'm only missing two. They may need to teach this message again next week. That one will pop out in the old, 38, and then 27 in the new. What, you got 25? 26? Let me count my, my list here real quickly. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. It's 26.